Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful that we can gather together in this place as God's people. I'm Lindsay, I'm the pastor here, uh, and a good morning to those tuning in online as well. We're glad that you can continue to join us. One of the things I love about church is that as we come here, we all come as equals. Maybe not in every sense, and maybe sadly, not even in the way that we treat one another, but before God, we come as equals. We come together before God as those who are only allowed into God's precious family because of one thing, because we've all known the forgiveness of the Father, because our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus, because the Spirit has washed us clean and made us new. Because we've experienced what David did in Psalm 32. Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the summer heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of, your, of my sin. If you're here today trusting in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And so we gather as a forgiven people. And later on this morning, Alan is going to help us think about how that ought to then shape our entire lives. And so we gather as forgiven people to glorify God this morning. And as we do that, would you please join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. We thank you that we can be gathered as a people from different parts of the world, uh, from different stages of life, uh, yet come as those who are equal before you, as your dearly beloved children, because we have been forgiven. Father, we're sorry for the ways in this week in which we have failed to live out our new lives that you've given to us through your forgiveness when we fail to obey you and we have fallen into sin. Father, please purify us. But thank you, Lord, that though we do still struggle and fail and fall, your forgiveness never ends, and so we can gather this morning. And we pray that as we gather, all we do might be for your glory. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of songs now, and so I invite you to stand as we sing, O Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer.
Well, thanks, uh, musicians, for helping us to sing Glory to God. Uh, well, now it's time for a bit of a few different announcements that we've got going on. Hopefully, you grabbed a notice sheet on the way in, which sort of outlines the big ones. Um, the first one is annual congregational meetings coming up uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, we've got uh, Bible study groups that you can be part of. Um, we also have the Lord's Supper next week, which I forgot to write in there, but it's on the first Sunday of each month, uh, unless I'm not here. Um, and then I thought I'd give you a quick youth update. Um, so we had a youth group and kids club on Friday, and particularly for the youth group, we had a combined night down in Cairns, where we combined with Cairns Prezi and Good Shepherd Anglican Church. And it was just a really encouraging time for the kids to travel down, uh, get some Maccas on the way, uh, and spend some time with about 50 other uh, high school Christian kids. Um, so that's really encouraging for the kids. So please keep praying for that uh, as we go about that. Uh, and now we have two special guest announcements. Uh, and so I'm going to start with Alan Polly, and then Marjorie is going to come up and do one. Is that correct, Marjorie? <laughs> you looked a little startled, I was concerned. You're next, Marjorie. Surprise. Uh, two announcements, for, uh, particularly for the men next weekend. Um, so there is a cruise in at the Atherton Men's Shed. Um, it's all about old cars um, and grunty men's stuff. So next um, Friday night, 5.30, it kicks off, 5.30 to 8. It's a community event. Um, Donnie's been a long time um, part of organising that. And in the, well, no, he, he just knows a lot of people that organise it. A supporter. He's a long-time supporter. That's right. Because a lot of business coming out of this. No, a kid. Um, but if, if you're are looking for something next Friday, that's um, a great uh, evening there. A few rides and foods for the kids as well to go along. Not this one. Food and coffee vans. The rides are in the cars on the way there, if, you, if, you, if you're lucky enough. The next morning, though, uh, next morning at, on next Saturday, 6.30, I uh, mentioned last week a men's walk and talk event. Um, next week, we're going to meet at Lake Eacham. Okay, so the idea is we'll arrive at 6.30 in the car park, so to gather around the, the start of the walking track. Um, we'll walk and exercise for about 45 minutes until about 7.30. So if that means if you can fit in one lap, you fit in one lap. If you want to try to fit in two or maybe even three, okay, you can go for it. If you want to bring your bike and head back out on the um, road, you know, if that's more your thing, please do that. But we'll, so we come, we meet at 6.30 in the car park. Um, I'd love, if anybody's interested in being part of it, but they would just enjoy being the person that cooks the bacon and the eggs so that when we all get back, we're ready to eat, um, come and chat to me about that too. Um, so there's some non-active roles if, if you're keen for that. But next, next Saturday, 6.30, Lake Eacham. Uh, we should be wrapped up there by about 8.30, 9 o'clock. So we'll exercise, uh, we'll eat, we'll spend time chatting, and then we'll get on with our Saturdays next week. All right, thank you. That was for the men. This is for the ladies. <laughs> but before I talk about the ladies, can I just remind all members of the Committee of Management that we have a quick meeting in the vestry after church. Get your cup of tea first or whatever while I count the money. Okay. This morning, I'd like to talk a little about the TPC Ladies Book Club, which I am enjoying being part of I love reading, so it was an easy decision for me to make to join. Um, but I'd like to encourage everyone, well, the females, um, to think about becoming a member. Good Christian books teach us things. They challenge us uh, in the way that we think, and they help us to walk more closely with the Lord. They do not replace the Bible. Both the books that we've read so far have been unmistakably Bible-based. So far, I've learned to lament in the biblical way, to take my griefs and hardships and questions to God, to tell him exactly how I feel, but also to affirm his goodness and restate my trust in him, even in the darkest times. It's been a good lesson for me to learn. 
I've also been encouraged in our second book to seek God's will for me by asking the better question, not what does God want me to do, but who does God want me to be? I was then challenged to consider how I should reflect God's character in my life by looking at 10 different attributes, including holiness, love, goodness, and justice. Now, I can list the other six, but I'll spare you the list. Now, reading is a solitary occupation, but coming together with others to discuss what we've read, to share how we've responded, and to ask the questions that have arisen, that's fellowship and a great blessing. The members come from both morning and afternoon congregations, so it's been a great opportunity for me to make connections across the gap. But it's also been good for me to get to know people in this congregation after being missing in action for so long. The club is not demanding. You don't have to read a book overnight or even in a week. And if you don't get it finished, you're not banned or barred from the meetings. Some of the ladies who met yesterday felt we needed to meet more often, but honesty compels me to admit that I got a bit lost in the discussion. So, but I do believe that the idea is to meet having read one book at least once a term. The next book we're reading is Spiritual Mothering, the Titus II model for women mentoring women by Susan Hunt, whom I've never heard of, but then I hadn't heard of the other ones either. I'm looking forward to getting started. Christian mentoring is something I've heard about and even read about a little bit, but I know next to nothing about it, so I'm hoping that this book will be another window opening. If you'd like to have a go at book club, why not start with spiritual mothering? Merrin will be ordering the books on Tuesday, so please don't delay. Contact her, or you could speak to me, to Lindsay, Alana, Leela, Rochelle. I don't think there's anybody else here. Um, after the service, and we'll get your message across to, uh, to Merrin. Do think about it. It's really good fun. G'day crew, how are you going this morning? Good, excellent. Does anyone... Ah, welcome Emily, it's good to see you. Does anyone in your family ever annoy you? Yes? Not. Does anyone annoy you Isaac? And in your family? Sometimes? And do they sometimes hurt you? Maybe they hit you or they call you names or something? Sometimes? Yeah. And do you then have to, do they then say sorry to you though, and to try and make it better? No, they don't. <laughs> Maybe they sometimes say sorry, or do you have to say sorry when you've hurt someone else? And then, but do you ever get sick of when someone has to say sorry to you all the time because they keep hitting you? Do you ever get a little bit sick of saying sorry to them maybe? Maybe you're too good at that, that you don't. Sometimes I get a bit sick of having to say sorry, to forgive, sorry. Do we ever have to get sick of forgiving people who say sorry? And uh, sometimes, I get a little bit sick of it and I wish, wish they'd just stop doing it rather than me having to forgive them all the time. And so Peter, the Apostle Peter, asked this question about forgiveness and how often we have to forgive someone who hurts us, right? And he says this in chapter 18, verse 21 of Matthew. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. So what, how many times does Peter think we should forgive people? Seven times, right? So that's not that much, is it? Can you imagine? And so I thought, but how do you keep track of that? So I thought, I've got some forgiveness cards here. So, Maddie, let's just imagine that you keep on hurting me, okay? You just love punching me in the arm, okay? And so you punch me in the arm. You don't actually actually punch me. And then you come back later and say, sorry, Lindsay. And I say, that's okay. I forgive you. There's your number one card. And then you come and punch me in the arm again. And I say, that's okay, Maddie. I forgive you. Number two. And then I keep on giving out cards because I've got to keep track of it. Oh, sorry, Manny. 
Oh, there's one for me. You probably got to give me a card back. Um, I forgive you. I forgive you. There's a couple. You hit me twice. I forgive you. But then you hit me one more time, and I give you the I don't forgive you card. I will never, ever forgive you. Okay, there you go. Sorry, never forgiving you again. Do you think that's how forgiveness is supposed to work? That we just give up seven cards and then that's it? No, it isn't, is it? Because Peter reckons it might be seven, but Jesus, he had something else to say. So Peter asked him, do we have to do it up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Which isn't about counting up to 77 and then giving them out 77 cards. But Jesus' number there was a really big number and a perfect number that said that we just have to keep on forgiving. Uh, and do you know why Jesus reckons that we should forgive forever? What do you reckon? It's because he's forgiven us, hasn't he? As we trust in Jesus, he's forgiven us. And so while we might get tired of forgiving other people sometimes who hurt us, we don't ever get tired of being forgiven, do we? We love to be forgiven. And so we need to remember that thanks to Jesus, as we trust in him, we're always forgiven by God. Uh, and so we should keep forgiving one another. And so I've got some cards for you guys, which are from God as we trust in God, which are the I forgive you forever from God cards. There you go. Hang on, Emily. There you go. Okay? Okay. And so that reminds us that as we trust in Jesus, he forgives us forever and ever, even when we keep on failing him, which is really special, isn't it? But I find forgiveness hard, and so why don't we pray to God to ask him to help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your forgiveness towards us. We're sorry that we struggle to forgive. Please help us to always remember how much we're forgiven, and so to keep forgiving one another, even when it hurts. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Righto, head back to your seats and there's activity sheets. Um, if Phyllis is ready, I invite her to come and pray for us. There she is. Thanks, Phyllis. This must be the, this must be the day for commercials. And thankfully, Maureen has uh, obtained a whole lot of... In this church, we do shoeboxes. We pack a shoebox and send it over uh, Cambodia and all those places. And that happens in the later part of the year. But to get ready for that, we do need to start early. And I've already got stuff at home. And Maureen has found all this material. Nancy's already picked up a whole lot and said, this will be little girl's skirts. If you'd like some, please have a look at the box afterwards and just take some home and start your wonderful creations so we'll have plenty to put in our shoe boxes when it comes September, October. I don't know how your week's been. Mine sort of took a few detours. <laughs> so I was looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17... Pray without ceasing, which I did. <laughs> Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let us join in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather here today in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Heavenly Father, nothing calms our souls more or better prepares us for life's challenges than time spent in your presence and with those who follow you. Thank you for your amazing power carrying this church forward for over 10 decades and that our worship place here in Jack Street, raising our voices in songs of praise, is a powerful testimony to passers-by. Thank you for the joy and the funds available to support missionaries taking the gospel to places where and when we cannot be. And that this is not just a church where people have once been saved, but a church where people are still being saved. Thank you for our online presence, giving those unable to join us the opportunity to share in worship with us. For Lindsay and Phil, for their biblical teaching, 
heightening our awareness of your grace, ushering our people into a lifestyle of service. Thank you for being our helper, for your Holy Spirit's conviction, correction and protection in our lives, for all the opportunities you have blessed us with. Heavenly Father, with all you have given and all you have done for us, we still fail. We disappoint, we neglect your teachings and we are not, in a, light, we are not a light in every place you have given us to walk. We have allowed our minds to think impure thoughts, fed on non-spiritual gossip and held in our heart jealousy, envy and bitterness. We have kept a record of wrongs of others. This is the nature of our sin and we are sorry. And Heavenly Father, we ask for your forgiveness. We thank you that through the suffering and death of Jesus, we can be cleansed of our sins. But you have made it very clear, if we harbour unforgiveness and hatred in our hearts towards others, then we have not truly repented of our sins. Heavenly Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We thank you that we have your promise, that we do not need to judge our brother or sister. We can give our grievances, resentments and hurts to you to transform us and give us power to forgive others. Thank you for the healing and wholeness that comes from releasing others' sins against us. Heavenly Father, we pray for the ongoing prayer groups of this church, reaching beyond closed doors into people's unique and sometimes desperate situations. Heavenly Father, we praise you for so many answered prayers, for great results for Eileen, for travelling mercies for David and Eileen, for Myrtle's op going well. Heavenly Father, we pray for Glenda and ask for your comfort and peace for her and ask that you will meet her needs. Heavenly Father, we pray for the local family grieving the loss of a loved one through drowning. We ask for comfort for the whole extended family and friends and especially for the mother and her two sons. Heavenly Father, we do not know the hour or, or the day when life is taken or our Lord returns. May we be good and faithful servants until in your perfect timing you call us home or you return. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for biblical values in this country being eroded for Christians and Christian schools facing increasing hostility, for the possible division between our nations being voted for. Heavenly Father, we do not despair, but look expectantly at a good outcome. Heavenly Father, we pray for the work of MAF, giving help, hope and healing in remote areas of the world. And we pray especially today for Ryan, the MAF pilot, wrongly held in Mozambique prison for almost four months, and also the two South African missionaries with him. We pray that this lengthy investigation will soon be completed and for Ryan and the two missionaries to be released. Heavenly Father, Give them strength and peace and opportunities to minister while in prison. Give them relief from, from the biting midges as they wait to be released. Heavenly Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit to do your work, to equip our people in their walk with Jesus, to be attentive and, uh, to the care of and engage with our visitors, to love as you do to build deeper relationships with those you have put in our lives, to plan opportunities and events so that others will be drawn to hearing of your salvation and hope, to build each other up 
in this church and encourage each other as we enjoy the fullness of being a spiritual family. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, oh, well, we're going to get to sing again. What's happened? Panic. I was panicked. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that would be exciting later on. Um, uh, it's time to sing again now. So let's stand and sing together, Oh, the mercy of God. It's time to hear from God's Word now. I think Marjorie's got the reading for us, and then Alan's going to come and preach. Thanks, Marjorie. Our reading today is Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21 and to the end of the chapter. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, 
Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered him, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Oh, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Oh, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. How's that, Heather? Better? Thank you. Uh, Well, please keep your Bibles open there, page 1401, Matthew 18. We're going to spend our time in that passage this morning to hear from God's Word. Um, Please join with me and pray as we do that. Father, we thank you for your Word, which is living and active. Thank you that, Father, it is your word to us so that we might know ourselves as well as knowing you. Thank you that we can feed on it this morning. Help us to receive it with faith and repentance. May your spirit be at work amongst us that we might be able to live out what this is calling us to for the praise of your glorious grace. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I hate you, poo-poo head, yells one child to the other in the poly household (laughs) on a daily basis. Mm. Mm. See, we have a problem in our family. We have a sin problem in our family. A big bunch of sinners. They get it from their parents. Mm. Someone is bound to get hurt. I grew up in a family like that too. Name-calling, jealousy, fighting, carrying on. We were kids. There was no shortage of sinfulness and brokenness. And it's sin and brokenness all the way down our family line. But I don't think my family is the only family in that situation. I don't think we're unique. Uh, It's all around us, isn't it? Uh, It's all around us. I saw a friend uh, on Facebook this week. I didn't see my friend. I saw them post something on Facebook. They were reading a book. They read something a little bit controversial to them. So they typed it in this little thing. 
You know, they requoted it. Here's what this person said. And then a 300-word rant on exactly, I can't believe they would say that. I can't believe they would use this language. Do they not know how stupid they're being, how harmful this is? Words have power, blah, blah, blah. Rather, well, gee, it got under his skin, didn't it? Well, my group of friends then, I noticed, as I just happened to be on when it was posted, and oh, someone replied, and someone else replied, yes, yes, boom, pile on, pile on, pile on, the vitriol and the hatred and the anger. It, it was quite ironic because at the end of his post he said, someone should go and talk to this guy about it. And here they are just all piling on together uh, around this author and his stupidity. Well, one person dared to say, I, I, I think maybe you're overreacting to this a little bit here and you're being a bit... Uh, ungenerous in your attributions to his motivations here but he was met with as much rage and as abuse as I expected it quickly descended into chaos but my friend who made the original post uh, I think it surprised him I, and I think he, he went away to make a cup of tea and he's come back to see his Facebook thing lit up like a Christmas tree and he's like oh what have I done and he posted then, I will now return to posting about my dogs and cups of coffee and teapots. Uh, he's, this is for my mental health, he says. He could, he could see what happened. He took offence to someone's choices of words. Not a friend in front of him, but it hurt him. And he got mad. But it showed me just how quick and easy these emotions within us can get stirred. And how quickly we, we throw metaphorical grenades at each other. But it happens all around us, doesn't it? Someone says something to you. They use a tone of voice. They roll their eyes. They ignore you. Or, or perhaps it, it's a bit more serious of an offence. It always cuts deeper when it's someone close to you, someone in your family, someone you look up to or someone you hope would know better. Well, last week we were given a template for how the church should love each other by talking to each other about our sin in hope that we can restore each other to the faith. But if you've restored them once, maybe twice or three times, well, how many times do you continue to do that before you say... Enough is enough. You hand the card, I will not forgive you anymore. See, that is exactly what Peter is asking at the beginning of today's passage. Look at verse 21. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Well, Jesus, to reply to this, tells a masterful story here about mercy and forgiveness. I'm going to walk through this passage, just retelling it with a bit of extra commentary along the way, and then we'll say, well, where does the rubber hit the road for us? How does that apply? Well, this question of Peter's, up to seven times, it was actually quite generous of Peter. There was the tradition at the time that three was enough. Forgive someone three times, fourth time, they're out. Three strikes and you're out. Perhaps that's where we get the saying from today. So how extravagant is Peter then to double it plus one, to make it this perfect number of seven? But as Lindsay showed, it takes quite a bit of memory to remember. Is, was that five times or six times? I, I can't remember. You, you would need to have a system of remembering this, wouldn't you? Well, Jesus pushes Peter beyond seven, and not just to ten not just to 20, but he completely blows it out of the water. Now, there's a little debate whether it's in the Greek, whether it's 70 or 77 or, or 70 times 7, which is 490, mind you. Yeah. But whatever the number, whatever the number, take your pick, it doesn't matter. It's hyperbolic from Jesus here. And the point is the same either way. The point is this. 
if you're still counting, you have not grasped the message of the gospel. If you're still counting forgiveness, you have not grasped the message of the gospel. Forgive forever. Never-ending forgiveness. No counting. That's radical, isn't it? Like That's completely blowing it out of the water. Maybe like Peter, your jaw is scraping on the ground at the moment here. Like, really, Jesus? They'll, they'll just take us for granted. This is ridiculous. No one forgives like that. Nobody forgives like that. But Jesus tells this story. In verse 23, we begin with a king. And he wanted to settle accounts with people that owe him money. It may have just been an annual check of accounts, nothing out of the ordinary. But this king must have been seriously rich. Seriously rich. Because this one man, just one debt that he was owed, was 10,000 bags of gold. We're talking a lot of money. Trillions of dollars. And a trillion, it just seems like a word. That's a million million. It's an unfathomable amount for one person, not just to have, but to owe. How did he come to owe so much money? We're not told. It's obviously not important because Jesus didn't tell us. But the point is that the debt was just mind-boggling. And he couldn't pay it. Of course not. It's it's impossible to pay that back. So the king did what was natural to do at the time. He took everything of value from the person, including their very lives. He he sold them, presumably, into slavery. You know, that's what he was going to do. He sold the house, he sold the horse, the buggy, the cart and yourself, your freedom. You're now a slave to pay it back. That's what they did. Now have a look at verse 26. Verse 26. How does the man respond? With the prospect of losing everything, this man grovels. He throws himself on the ground and he begs for mercy. He knew he had to beg like this because his life, not just his, but his wife and his children, depended on it. So he's on his knees humbly before the king and he says, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. Really? Did you hear what he said? There was two parts, wasn't there? Be patient with me. Okay, okay, I can understand that. And I will pay back everything that I owe. Pay back a trillion dollars? It's impossible. That's a million dollars a day. Not just for a year. Not just for a decade. But for 3,000 years. A million dollars a day. That's with 0% interest rate, too. All right. Too bad if the Reserve Bank changes the rate. So he's either overestimated his ability to earn, yeah? Or he's underestimated his debt by a long way. Or thirdly, he's underestimated the generosity of the king. See, what is the king's reaction? Verse 27, the king took pity or mercy on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. The king has dishonoured himself by taking on the debt and honoured the servant. Now, to understand this correctly, we have to understand what happened with the debt. Did it just vanish? But what does it mean for a debt to be cancelled? I mean, nothing physically changed hands here between the servant and the king. But the debt 
still cost someone. Uh, recently in America, Joe Biden, one of his election promises uh, was bringing into a law the student debt forgiveness program. I'm not exactly sure how it all ended up. There was a lot of court challenges back and forth, as is typical for American politics. Um, but the plan was presented as something like this. Students who go to university, they don't have a HEX program like we do here, but you take out loans. You know, there's, there's banks that specialise in this kind of stuff, and they've got lots of debt in this. But Biden said, well, students who have debt, I'll just wipe away... 10,000, 20,000 of your debt, gone. Cancelled, all done. Doesn't cost anyone anything. But that's not quite how it works, is it? The student loan is owed to somebody and that debt can only be reduced by someone paying for it or the lender making a loss. And in this case, it's the American taxpayer who's going to be paying for student debt. The government pays the lender and they collect the taxes from Joe Bloggs. See, forgiveness is never free. Someone is always paying the cost. And in this case here in Matthew, who pays the debt? It's the king. He absorbs the cost himself and he lets the servant go free. It costs the king dearly, a trillion dollars. Well, this incredible display of mercy here from the king is immediately matched by an incredible and appalling lack of mercy by the servant. The servant, now debt-free and forgiven, turns around and he walks out of the building, out of the king's castle, perhaps his king's court. And what do you expect him to do? Perhaps go home and celebrate with his family. Can you believe what's just happened? I'm, I'm debt free. Maybe get his friends together and throw a party. No, he immediately tracks down one of his fellow servants who owes him money and he begins to choke him. Pay me that money, he says. He resorts to violence just to get back a hundred silver coins. Now, now, 100 silver coins, is, it's not nothing, right? I mean, I, I don't step over 50 cents if I see it on the ground. Okay, this is 100 silver coins. I'd be happy with that. But it's, it's not nothing. It's something. But in comparison, in comparison to what he has been forgiven, this is a drop in the ocean. What should he have done? Well, the forgiven servant should have let this man go free. Keep the change. It's nothing. He's now a trillion dollars richer. What's a hundred silver coins to him? Out of gratefulness, he should have passed on the debt forgiveness. But he doesn't, does he? Look at verse 29. His fellow servant even uses the very same plea with him. That should have pricked his ears. Be patient with me. Hey? That's, that's just what I said. <laughs> yeah. But he doesn't even realise it. There's no compassion. Not even a hint. Instead, he throws the man into jail until... He he could repay his debt. Unbelievable. There are three unbelievable elements in this parable, isn't there? There's the debt, a trillion dollars, one person, unbelievable. There's the mercy of the king to forgive that debt. And there's the cold and heartless response of the servant. It's an outrageous response, isn't it? You, you can imagine this story being told on, uh, I don't know what today's, the Oprah Winfrey show, you know, American daytime television. The servant over here, the king over here, offences being thrown back. Over. You did this, you did this. The chair gets lifted up. It's high drama. 
And it's right that we should feel outrage at this man. It's right. If you're unmoved by this, it's not hitting us, is it? It's right that we should feel outrage. And that's exactly how some of the servants felt in the story, wasn't it? Verse 31, the other servants then, in outrage, went to the king and dobbed on this guy. Hey, do you know what he just did? This guy that you've forgiven has just gone and choked this other guy, thrown him in jail for a hundred silver coins. So the king called the man back whom he had forgiven and he rebuked him for his lack of mercy and he handed him over to be tortured. In the end, he got a part of what he deserved. He was still forgiven the debt, but he was, got a part of what he was deserved as a punishment for his lack of mercy. And he wasn't changed one bit by the mercy that was shown to him. This guy is an absolute disgrace. <clears throat> but Jesus doesn't leave us here in the story with our anger pointed at the servant, does he? As we're pointing our finger at this servant, you disgraceful human being, how could you not pass on that forgiveness? Jesus turns it back on us. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. I like the story until then. What? Hang on. What did Jesus just say here? Did, did Jesus just say what I thought he said? Like, if I don't forgive my brother and sister from the heart, this is how my Father in heaven will treat you. All of a sudden it's shifted gears here, hasn't it? See, while we're talking about the unmerciful servant, it's easy to pile on hate. It's, uneasy, it's easy to be a keyboard warrior and just, yeah, 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 bad guy, bad guy, no good, no good, poo-poo, head. But Jesus turns it on its head to us. Will you be that unmerciful servant? Will you be that unmerciful servant? And it's not just here that he mentions it. it this isn't just a one-off from Jesus. How about these words? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's the only thing in the Lord's Prayer that we're called to do. The only thing. It's also echoed in James chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. It says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If we're still counting the sins of others, we have not grasped the gospel in its fullness. If we're still counting the sins of others, we have not grasped the gospel in its fullness. We must be merciful as we have been shown mercy. Well, the point of the parable here is so clear, isn't it? And it draws us in and it gets us all riled up to realise that that's us. But if it's so clear and easy to say, oh, that's what we should do, then why is it still so hard to do it? I'm assuming that it's so hard 
to do it, right, for, for all of you too. I don't think I'm unique. I struggle with this so much. Uh, this, this sermon in God's providence um, has been the very sermon that I've needed to hear myself. Uh, I've been wrestling with this on so many levels. And I, I think it's hard because it really is not natural to us at all. As humans, to forgive is not natural. This is a divine act. I find it so hard to forgive what, when someone has wronged me. But why? Why is it so hard? Okay, it's not natural for us, but there's more to that. I think the answer lies in the parable here. This servant was not able to extend mercy because he didn't recognise the significance of the debt that he was granted forgiveness from. See, the extent to which you're aware of your debt is the extent that you'll pass on that forgiveness. If you had a speeding fine, $300, and you received a letter from the government to say, that, oh, sorry, we got something wrong, uh, you're forgiven that debt, it's cancelled. Woohoo, sweet. Go out for a meal this week, take the family out. What a nice surprise. But it's not that life changing, it's, it's 300 bucks. But your mortgage, everything you owe, if you received a letter to say, hey, your mortgage, you've been drawn out of a hat. Congratulations, your debt has been cancelled. Yeah. What a relief. I'll take that. See, to grow in forgiveness, we must know, or we must grow in our knowledge, both here and here, our knowledge of the gospel. What is the price that Jesus paid for you on the cross? It was so big, your debt was so big that nothing short of the divine, eternal Son of God coming to take your place in death was sufficient. Your debt was so big that nothing less than that was sufficient to pay for it. Your debt was so great, but his love for us was greater still. The gospel is the engine room here for our forgiveness. And we need to grasp the gospel more deeply and deeply. And out of grasping the gospel more deeply and deeply will flow from us. Rivers of mercy. Oh, I see this pattern in my life. The, the more I'm grasping the gospel, the more I'm in the word, the more I'm praying the more I'm in fellowship. I see that I'm, I'm more patient. I'm more, it's easier to be empathetic. It's easier to extend forgiveness. The gospel is the engine room for our forgiveness. Because I, I see it in reverse too. When I'm not in the word, when I'm not praying, when I'm not spending time at church, I'm not reminded of the gospel, of the grace for me. See, we, we don't move on from the gospel once we're saved. Like Paul says in a Colossians, he says, 
be rooted and established and built up in the gospel. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a little handbag that we take along with us. It's, it's not an accessory for us. But the gospel of grace is our address where we live. It's our new identity. So we are to extend the forgiveness that God has shown to us onto others. Forgiving forever. But like my children, if I just, there are times when I say, you know, do this, do this, do this. And then eventually they're not doing it and they look at me and they say, I don't know what you're asking. They don't understand. What, what does that mean? I, I want to just now stop and let's dig into that. What does forgiveness look like for us? Okay, we're meant to forgive, but what does it look like? Well, here's the definition that I found most helpful. Forgiveness is renouncing revenge and it's being open to reconciliation. It's renouncing revenge and it's being open to reconciliation. So so what is renouncing? Well, renouncing, it's a conscious decision to let go of any claim or right that you had. It's a decision that you make. It's not a feeling that you feel. This means that you can forgive someone even while you are still really, really angry about the situation. In fact, you might still feel angry towards that person for some time to come, even after you've made the decision to forgive them. It's a bit like marriage, in a way. You you decide to marry someone, and you make the promises, and regardless of how you feel in one or two or ten or twenty years, if you feel married or not, you are. Your, and your choice to love them unconditionally is a continuation of your decision that you made all those years ago, regardless of how you feel at the time. So too with forgiveness. Your decision comes before the feelings. The warm and fuzzies may not return for some time. And just because you may feel angry about it over and over and over again that doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven them. It just means that you must keep acting on the decision that you've made. This idea of forgive and forget, that it's not going to come back and well up within you, that's fairy tales. It has no place in reality. Forgive and forget is a fairy tale. I think there's a great example in the scripture in the Psalms where David doesn't downplay how his enemies had wronged him. No, he, he records them for us. He didn't forget. But he cast them to God in prayer rather than pursuing revenge himself. So what is the decision that we make? Well, it's to renounce revenge. It's to renounce, to lay aside pursuing any payment from that person. We will not seek their unhappiness. We will not seek their suffering of the person who has wronged you. You release them from owing you anything. And instead, you absorb the cost of that offence yourself. It will be costly. That's why it hurts so much. Now, I'm really challenged to think about the times when I have forgiven someone, but at least in my mind, but I'm still quite happy bad-mouthing them and disparaging them and spreading the story. It makes me feel better, but... 
It's not renouncing revenge, is it? It's seeking a form of revenge. So forgiveness is to renounce revenge, but secondly, it's also that we must still aim for reconciliation and the restoration of that broken relationship. Important to recognise here that reconciliation is different from forgiveness, though. Okay. We are able to forgive someone even if they haven't repented or apologised. They may not even be aware that they've hurt you or offended you. We can do our internal forgiveness towards them. But it might be the case that the other person is not willing to be reconciled. If you go and speak to them like the passage last week encouraged us to. Well, in Romans, Paul says, as long as it depends on you, be at peace with your neighbours. Reconciliation in this life may not come. It also means that we, we don't have to wait for the repentance of the other person to forgive them. We don't have to wait for that relationship uh, to be restored. But we must remain hopeful that it will be. We must hold out that hope. Maybe someday that relationship will be restored. Do I need to do something? Do they need to do something? That's what we're called to. The, the trust after a hurt will be damaged, right? It won't be the same as before. But we can restore it as far as practical. Uh, in the process of reconciling also, there will be some levelling with each other. You have to talk about the elephant in the room. But in God's character, this is where mercy and truth and justice meet. We, we don't let any one of those go. We speak truthfully. We seek justice. But we also bring mercy as we've been shown. Christian forgiveness holds this tension together of truth and justice and mercy. None of the three overriding the others, but bringing it together in wisdom. I think it's also important and helpful for us to note the difference between this model of forgiveness and some other common models around one model that the world offers um, when it talks about forgiveness is a sense that will you forgive someone for, for yourself, for your own mental well-being. And although in, in God's wisdom that's true, that, that does play out like that, we are released from a burden when we forgive. But this is not the highest purpose for our forgiveness we must forgive because it brings glory to God who has already forgiven each of us our immeasurable debt and it is the gospel that is the engine room for your forgiveness not your desire for your own well-being but it is the gospel that is the engine room for forgiveness and that it is the glory of God that is our goal in forgiveness. Why don't we pray that God might continue to pour out his grace in us that we would do this. Gracious Heavenly Father, Father of all mercy and grace, We thank you for the reminder here of our great salvation. That we have not only been saved by our Lord Jesus, but we've been saved for a purpose of bringing glory to your name. But Father, it is a little counterintuitive and unnatural for us that we can bring you glory through our silent suffering of forgiveness. Father, would you please be growing in us hearts that are gripped by the grace of the gospel. May we have a deeper understanding of the debt that you have paid for us. And may this transform our hearts 
to be rivers of mercy. Please give us wisdom to keep the tension of seeking truth and justice and mercy in the situations that we face each day. May we not elevate one above the other, but hold on to all three. And Father, we ask that as a church that you would help us to be characterised by this more and more. Help us not to settle for cheap imitations, but help us to pursue Christian forgiveness. Help us not settle for a mild indifference towards each other. Help us to avoid slander and gossip. And help us to persevere in our decision of forgiveness when we're reminded and our emotions are stirred time and time again of the offence. We ask this, Father, knowing that you are with us, that you are with us all the way to the end and you delight to see your children grow. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Alan. We'll invite the musos as they're coming on up and we're going to sing of God's great mercy that he's shown to us now with his mercy is more. So let's stand and sing together. Please hang around for a cuppa and some morning tea, um, but let me leave us with some words from Paul in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Have a blessed weekend.